So in what we're going to look at next, we're going to make this assumption just so that we don't have to deal with those indices. Think of a reservoir. So the reservoir is going to be a 2D reservoir. We're going to have 12 grid blocks, three in the X direction, four in the Y. It's going to be insulated or no flow on these three sides. So a lot of times we draw no flow like this. And then on this side, we have that the pressure is a constant pressure boundary condition. So we're going to take a look at a couple of the scenarios and see what the implicit equations will look like. So we'll start with looking at one of the interior grid blocks. So in this case, five, five or eight of the two interior. So when I say interior, I mean uh, all its neighbors are regular grid blocks. They're not boundary conditions. Yeah. So five and eight are the two interiors. And if we write the mass balance on grid five, again, assuming homogeneous isotropic uniform, then we're going to have that Here. And so then we're going to group some terms, and we're also going to multiply the equation on both sides by minus one so that we get and now we've we've chosen to evaluate the pressures at the n plus one time step so we're talking about an implicit method here
So, I need to do a Q5 right there, sorry. So the sort of takeaway from this is that, I mean, you notice the 4T here that corresponds to the number of neighbors. So except when you have a constant pressure boundary condition, that's always going to be the case, in fact. You'll see uh, that you'll see that the, the, no, the number that shows up here is going to be the number of neighbors of the grid block. So we're going to go on, we'll look at a no flow boundary condition for one of these boundaries here, or the 11, is one we'll write it for. But you can see 11 has three neighbors, and when we write out all the terms, you'll see that there's a 3T right there, right? But another way to think of it is, and, and this turns out that uh, can be an, just an easier way to think of it all together. You can think of if, if there's a layer of fake grid blocks all around the side, right? Then all of the real grid blocks, the one, one to 12, they all have f four neighbors, right? So they have four Ts all along the radial, right? Except when you were to go and compute the inner block transmissibility. Now here we don't have that, right? We're just talking about there's no inner block transmissibility because everything is homogeneous isotropic, right? But in the, in the general case, when you have homo, uh, when, you're, when you're computing inner block transmissibilities, any transmissibility across a no flow boundary condition would be zero, which would reduce your, you know, that term, that would be, you know, some transmissibility times the pressure difference, right? That term's going to go away. So that would re reduce your, say, 4T to 3T, right? What about one on the boundary here? Where it has two boundaries? Same thing, right? You'd have 4T, and if you, if, you can, if you imagine there were fake grid blocks out there, you'd have 4T, but two of those would be zero, and that'd give you 2T. That's also the number of neighbors you have. So you can think about it either way. So yeah, so we'll look at grid block 11, which is on the top. So we had 10, 11, 12, and 8 here. And this was no flow. So we're going to write the mass balance for 11. So you see I have P top, that's my sort of fake grid block, right? But if there's no flow across it from Darcy's law, there's not going to be any pressure drop either, right? So in that case, this guy goes to zero. So then if we group terms, multiply by minus one. And evaluate the pressures at the n plus one time step to get an implicit method.
beat that guy. And like I said, you get a 3T there. So we derived it from actually writing the mass balance and considering the no-flow boundary condition up top, across the top. But in the result, you know, if you can just remember, in general, for all boundaries, or you know, you're going to have the, the number on the uh, the number right here will be corresponding to the number of neighbors. So now we'll consider, we'll look at grid block nine, which was along the constant pressure boundary. So we're going to write the mass balance on nine. Out here we had P equals PB. So now, when we write down the flux across this boundary, we have 2t, pv minus p9. And, the, and this is just like in the 1d case. The 2t comes from the fact that what we actually do is we compute the transmissibility from the center of the grid block to the edge. And the center block of the grid block to the edge has a distance delta x over 2. And therefore, you get this effective permeability, of, I mean, the effective transmissibility of 2t. So then when we group terms and write everything out, So just like in the 1D case, we have this additional 2T PB that appears over here. Yeah, sorry, P9. So when you have a constant pressure boundary condition, it's it's sort of the unique case, right, in the sense that if it's an interior grid block or if it's a no-flow boundary, it's just what appears here is simply the number of neighbors. Right. It's either four, three, or two. Right. I guess you could have a very odd reservoir that had one neighbor, but anyway, four, three, two, or one. 
But when you have the constant pressure boundary condition, you, you have to do something different. So you get the additional T that appears because we're, we're writing the transmissibility from the center to the edge. So I think I'll, I was going to work one on the corner grid, but I think I'll just go to the slides because